Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Panath LLP, Aerial Property Advisors, Sterling National Bank, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, Amarant Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, B6 Real Estate Advisors, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Properties LLC Handler Real Estate, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringo Family Foundation, and these friends. I don't know anything about real estate. I like advertising. I don't really know. I'm going to get involved with this company because they need me as the token. I'm going to be involved. I'm going to go to Saudi Arabia. I'm going to be in London. I'm going to be involved with other aspects of real estate. I have the man from Munaki, New Jersey, Jamie Weiss. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Because you have a very interesting family history. Tell me about when you are Father's side came over and then your mother's side. So let's start with dad's side. Well, from what I know, my father's real father, his biological father, was a guy named Freed. That's all I know. And he left uh, my grandmother with four kids in Costa Street in the Bronx. And my grandfather, David, moved in because he was uh, coming from uh, Hungary to study uh, business. That's, that's David Weiss. David Weiss, yes. Right. And so David uh, somehow crept into my grandmother's bedroom, and they had a fifth kid, Eugene. Did they have the fifth kid before they were married? or after? I visited the cemetery yesterday, but I wasn't able to get any answers. I, I understand. So this is David Weiss, who is your grandfather. Right. And he adopted all the kids, okay. which is wonderful. Right. Let's go to mom's side. Tell me about mom's side. Okay. So um, mom's um, mother, Toba, came over from England with her husband, Jacob, and they had three children. And unfortunately, Jacob developed cancer and he died when my mother was three. So she barely knew him, except to uh, drag me over to Staten Island to United Hebrew Cemetery very often to visit her father. She was a very devoted mother. And uh, I was named after Jacob. Let's now try to do a little tracing of history. So David Weiss, which was grandpa, which was your father's adopted father, what did David do for a living? So David uh, became a uh, life insurance salesman for Metropolitan Life, and he spoke fluent Hungarian, and they made him uh, eventually uh, the branch manager for Metropolitan Life in Yorkville. He was very successful. He got a lot of medals. <laughs> Okay, so didn't make any money, they made a lot of so medals. That's David Weiss, okay? Yes, yes. Now let's go about your mother's father. He died at three years of age. Yes. So there was no grandfather. The mother, her mother supported the family, right? Correct. She had three children, Al, Sammy, and Lucille, my mother. And they lived in a tenement on 104th Street, Lexington Avenue, with, you know, no toilet. The toilet was in the hallway. And she was a seamstress. She did a lot of work for the... Uh, policeman and for the firemen. Now, it's interesting that Uncle Sammy, we have a picture of Uncle Sammy with a class who was not that member of the organized mob, but
But everybody he went to school with was a member of the mob, right? Uh, essentially, yes. He was, uh, he was loved by East Harlem, and he had many, many friends in, um, in that business. And um, they, they adored him, they admired him, uh, but he never wanted to enter the field. Okay. Uh, and they, and they re respected him, and they loved him for that. And he went to the Cope, and he went to the, uh, uh, all the nightclubs. So what did Uncle Sammy do? He was an upholsterer. Okay, we have a picture of him with the, one of the pillows over there. Yeah. He was the only upholsterer that upholstered all the foreign, all the Rolls Royces, the Bentleys, um, and the Mercedes, why don't they have Mercedes Benz in those days? But he had a shop on 95th Street and 1st Avenue called United Auto Upholstery. He owned it. So let, now let's talk about Dad, okay? Dad was born in Brooklyn, you said to me, right? right? And tell me about your dad, because he was, he was supposed to play football, and then he had an accident with his eye. What happened? Right. Well, he was a great athlete, and um, he, he played football for Dewitt Clinton High School, and uh, he was kicked in the eye, and, and, and he had a hemorrhage in the eye, and eventually he lost the eye. He was able, unable to go to Cornell, um, and um, never, never played ball after that. I played a little handball, uh, in the Bronx, uh, but that's as far as he went in terms of his athletic ability. How did mom and dad meet? Well, my dad worked for the government um, in, in some sort of administrative capacity, and my mother was in a typing pool. <laughs> so they met uh, in the Bronx, I believe, uh, during work. Right, and I think you and said to me they got married in 1941. They did. Dad was still working for the government, and Mom was working for the government. Right, but then Mom retired, and Dad continued to work for various government agencies, um, went out in Long Island and worked for Republic Aviation, and then he worked for uh, Corps of Engineers for a while, where I worked uh, as a summer intern, um, and then he worked for the Defense Contract Audit Agency for a good number of years. Which is where a number of careers, which we'll go over. Hope you learned. Correct. You were born in uh, May 6th, I believe, 1943? May 4th. May 4th, okay, it was pretty close. Right. 1943, and you were born in the Bronx. And when did your parents move to Parkchester? And tell me the story of how they got into Parkchester, because it was an interesting sure. story. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, you know Parkchester was developed by Metropolitan Life, and uh, it was a segregated community. There were no blacks allowed. To, um, and they discriminated against Jews, but they let some Jewish families in. And uh, Grandpa worked for Metropolitan Life, as I, as I recounted earlier. Life insurance, which at that time they called death insurance. Okay. That's why they bought policies, so they had he did a, money for burials. They respected him, and he got the entire family apartments. So everybody lived in Parkchester. My mom and dad, my aunt and uncle, my cousins, we all lived in Park, Parkchester. So let's talk about growing up in Parkchester in the Bronx as a kid. Well, it was interesting, you know, I, I played every sport. So I played softball and I played basketball and they had leagues. Um, you know, I was never a good player, but I was always, you know, good enough to be on the team and I enjoyed it. And we played dodgeball and, uh, you know, all the other sports. So it was a nice life. as Yeah, it was a nice life. You know, you got out at seven, seven o'clock in the morning, you came back at six. And where'd you go to public school? PS 106. And then junior high school? PS 127. And then high school? High school in James Monroe High School. As I was alluding at the opening of the show, you didn't know anything about real estate. Now, you said Dad was able to get you a job when you were in high school? My dad got me jobs in the wintertime, you know, uh, Christmas and um, during, during recess, the Corps of Engineers. Um, but I also applied for a job at the placement office at uh, Monroe. And I got a job with Nevin's Kirshner Music Company at 1650 Broadway. The famous Brill Building. Exactly, yeah. And I worked for Donnie, Donnie Kirshner. And I met um, Carol King and Jeffrey Goffin, and Barry Mann, Cynthia Weil, Neil Sedaka. And I was, the, I was the office boy that summer. So you graduate Monroe in 1961. 1961. And then... You decide to spend a couple of years in Bowling Green. Right. And, and then you decide to come back to City College. Correct. So when you come back to City College, uh, you get a job again for another music company, right? I was working for Decca Records. And what, you were in advertising or you were... I was in advertising. I was, I was the assistant advertising manager. $75 a, a, a week. I worked for my cousin Murray, who was the manager of, of advertising. 
Oh, so Cousin Murray got you help. Murray, Murray did it all. Yeah, oh. Murray Lauber, he was a great guy. Um, and he took you to the restaurant of, uh, on the steakhouse you told me about? Well, okay, I actually, I did that myself. If you're able to go to the topographer to check out the type, they had topographers, and you take, check out the type, they took you to Johnny Johnson's Steakhouse, which was like marvelous, you know. Right, it was so, the, like the printers, you know, when they printed exactly know, the IPO information. You, you know, you had to, they had you know, line some, of type. Somebody had to do it. Somebody them. had to set the line of type in those days, and I went there to correct the errors, and I kn knew that if you did that during lunch, they would buy you uh, a steak dinner. And it was the, my first uh, filet mignon. <laughs> so what, what happens is you graduate City College in 1969, correct? Right. Because this year is the celebration of your 50th anniversary. Right. And you said to me uh, you have a great honor that you're like the alumni of the year. You're getting an award. I you? am. I'm getting an award for uh, Distinguished Alumni for 1969, which I'm very proud of. I've been active in, in Baruch with City College and uh, the Baruch Fund. And um, I'm going to graduation in, in the Barclay uh, Center. You're going to go to graduation with the First cap time. and gown? I, you know, the, when I got my degree, I said, that's it. You know, I never picked up my uh, diploma. Uh, they mailed it to me because I was, you know, what, nine years, ten years to go to college. I figured that was it. So uh, I'm going to my first graduation on June 3rd. Okay, so, so now you finish City College, Decca Records. What happens with this company called Cross and Brown? Well, that's interesting. Uh, I'm still going to school, uh, and uh, my dad said, why don't you go to the placement office? I know the placement director because he, he places a lot of accountants with my uh, government agency, the Defense Contract Audit Agency. So my father was the head of personnel, which is now Human Resources. So he had uh, you know, control of about 900 employees. And he hired all the accountants. You know, Baruch was a great source for accountants. So I meet the placement director. Unfortunately, I forgot his name, but he was a wonderful guy. And he hands me a three-by-five card. It says, Industrial Sales Trainee, Cross and Brown. I looked at it. I said, what's this? He says, just go to this. you got to go on this interview. And that was it. I, what, you thought it was a advertising I had no or a record company? I had no clue what, what an industrial real estate brokerage firm. So what happens with Mr. Waldron? Okay, you get oh, the right. Cross and Brown at 522 of Fifth Avenue, Fifth right. Avenue Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley Building, or J.P. Right. Morgan at that time. Right? Yes. What happened? You couldn't go to the bank, by the way, because you know, you know, they wouldn't okay. allow Jews downstairs. Okay. But anyway, so 522 Fifth Avenue would go for my interview, third floor. I walk in, and I said, I'm not leaving. I said, this is my life. I said, this is the, what I want to be. I had no clue, but I, I saw these diagrams of all these buildings that they managed and they rented. And they made me wait about an hour, an hour and a half. And Waldron comes out, dynamic guy, you know, NYU graduate, wrestling champ. But he comes out with another guy, Marty Quinn. And he said, let's have breakfast at the Harvard Club. Well, <laughs> how could I say no? The right, right around the corner? Around, around the corner, the Harvard Club. So we have breakfast. And they said, you're hired. You're going to work for us. You're going to make $100,000 a year. I said, that's terrific. He says, just start tomorrow. I at said, $75. At, at $75. I said, well, okay. A week. A week. Not, not $100,000. Right, right. $75 a week. So uh, when could you go to work, Jamie? I said, um, I can't go to work right away. It's the Jewish holidays. Now, I figured that would blow the deal. But they wanted me because I didn't know this, but they wanted a Jewish kid to work for them. So they can go to the Uris brothers and Rudin and, and all the other Jewish landlords and, and, and investors uh, uh, to show them they have a Jewish kid working now, for them. Now, wasn't there an interesting, the, the two of them wanted you, but there was a guy who didn't really want you, right? It was a Mr. Murphy. He was the personnel director and the head of management. So he interviewed me and he said, we'll get back to you. I wrote him, wrote him a nice little note. Dear Mr. Murphy, Thank you for the time and courtesy you extended to me. I'd love to work for Cross and Brown. Never heard from him. So about two weeks later, the phone rings. It's Marty Quinn. He says, why haven't you shown up for work? I said, because Mr. Quinn said, and he said, <phone rings> Mr. Quinn, come in tomorrow. I said, well, Marty, I can't come in because it's still another Jewish holiday. Right, we started the Rosh Hashanah right. Young Kippur. Yeah, he didn't get it, but he said, when is it over? I told he said, come in the next day. And I did follow those instructions. Like, and who did I meet? Mr. Quinn, he says, what are you doing here? Go into the conference room. They had me wait an hour. They were yelling and screaming, and Waldron prevailed, and I was hired. So you're hired over there, and, and you had a, a good career over there. 
for a couple of years. And then how, how do you end up in Saudi Arabia? Well, for, uh, for Cross and Brown. Well, I'm working for Bob. I was very close to Bob. You know, I mean, I did everything for Bob. And I learned a tremendous uh, amount of uh, knowledge uh, f being in the real estate, industrial real estate, all over New York and New Jersey, Connecticut, Long Island. So we, we, we hit all the, all the spots. He said to me, we're going to Saudi Arabia. I said, what? He said, yep, I came from a trip in London. I met these Egyptians and we're gonna do modular housing for Tom Payne Company in Spokane, Washington, and you're gonna be the president of international modular housing, and you're gonna to go to Saudi Arabia and sell housing, and that's what I did. So how did mom and dad react when you said you were going to Saudi Arabia? Well, um, they were happy, and, and they were uh, frightened at the same time, you know, skeptical, but. Yeah, but isn't there an interesting story that in order to go to Saudi Arabia, Besides a passport, you needed right. a permit or some a baptismal certificate. A baptismal right. certificate. Let's well, I got talk about that. I got one from a carpenter in Kalamazoo, Michigan. That was after you went to the priest. Well, I went to a priest in Williamsburg, and that didn't work out. He wanted too much money. Unfortunately, didn't work out. So, how'd you find the uh, the carpenter in, uh, in through, the Midwest? Through uh, National Homes. National Homes was a very lo one of our largest suppliers. Of, of housing, modular housing, and the president of the National Homes got one of his carpenters who was an ordained minister to give me a baptismal certificate. So you spent two years in Saudi Arabia? T two, two visits of over six months each. Dramatic. And, and you were selling what, modular homes? To well, I sold most of the homes in the United States. I traveled all over the United States building the homes, and then I flew uh, Pan Am. Remember the Pan Am first flight to London, then I had to take another flight uh, to Saudi Arabia. And uh, when we got off the uh, plane from Saudi Arabia, uh, there were all these guys in machine guns and, and headgear, you know, uh, with the Saudi headgear. It was very intimidating. And they opened up my luggage, they went through my luggage, and um, Frank Visconti, one of my dear friends, was on the other side of the fence waving to me and got me into Saudi Arabia. The so rest you of come back from Saudi Arabia in what, it's 79? 79. And what happens then? Um, I go to work for Eddie Gordon. Eddie offers you an opportunity, but you didn't take that opportunity the first no, time. No, Waldron got upset and he called up Eddie and went to me and cried to me and begged me to stay. And I said, all right, Bob. So then you decided to go to the legendary Eddie Gordon. And then I went to Eddie. I re realized that that was where uh, I wanted to be. And it was dynamic. Let's talk guy. about Eddie and the, the Sony property or something. There was a deal that you were involved with Eddie. Yeah, well, I mean... Myers Brothers and parking and so on. Well, I mean, I got a free parking space at Myers Parking. Thank you, Eddie. Um, and I was the... Uh, That's when you had the blue car? I had a blue a Cadillac. Uh, my Uncle Sammy, Uncle Sammy from the upholstery business... You got, sure Uncle Sammy wasn't involved with the other guys? Who were, he was involved, but not involved. Okay. He was so loved. Uncle Sammy helped you get a... He got me the baby blue a Cadillac convertible, which I took to Jersey, and, you know, on all my appointments. I was the head of the suburban office for uh, Eddie Gordon, and it was a great relationship. And I put an ad in the paper for uh, space. I get a call from Mass Back Hardware down on Hudson Street. And um, I showed him space in New Jersey. It was the Fabergé building. And um, I went to see them, and we were going to buy the building and lease it to uh, Maspec on a long-term lease. And Eddie turned to me and said, well, how much is the commission? I said, $750,000. He said, did you ever make a $750,000 commission? I said, no, but I want to buy the building. I want to I own real estate. He convinced me uh, not to buy the building, uh, but we were going to sell it to uh, Hearts Mountain. So we had a contract with Hearts Mountain. The deal blew up at the 11th hour. We never made the deal. Hearts Mountain gave me a $50,000 uh, bonus uh, for the introduction because they went made a deal with, another, with Hearts Mountain in another building with another broker. It was a difficult experience for me to, to, uh, to deal with, so I left Eddie to form my own firm, Jamie M. Weiss Company. You have Jamie Weiss Company. Right. And how do you, how do you end up at Cushman and Wakefield? Well, Steve was a motivating factor, there's no question about it. Um, and uh, I'll get into that story, in a, but I want to go back to Cross and Brown. So I'm at Cross and Brown, and the phone rings, it's the switchboard operator, going back a couple of years. And she says, there's a call for Vincent Burns. Vincent Burns had left the company. He was a very 
outstanding broker, industrial real estate broker in New Jersey. He formed a firm called Burns and Foodie, left, left Cross and Brown. So the phone call came in and I took it. It was the United Methodist Publishing House in Teaneck. So I developed a relationship uh, with the uh, branch manager in Teaneck. Nothing happened. Become Jamie Weiss Company. He says, we want to sell the building. I found the buyer for the building. And it turns out that deal uh, fell apart at the 11th hour. And Steve and I were having uh, cocktails one night. And he says, why don't we buy the building? So Steve and I bought the building. So you, get, you work for Cushman right. for a period of time. And then after Cushman and Wakefield, you had a short period of time with Newmark. Right. I worked with Barry and, and Jeffrey. Barry Gosson and Jeffrey Garral it was a great partnership, and we did really well. And um, so then you go back to Jamie M. Weiss right. and Company, and let, let's talk about certain things in your history. Firestone, talk to me about Firestone. Right, the stores and the and the facility that you and your your buddy bought in the Midwest. My first relationship with, with Firestone goes back to uh, Billy Mack. Um, and the building that Firestone owned on exit 8A in New Jersey, the big blue building. Um, I sold that to Billy, uh, and that was the sole broker, and developed a great relationship uh, with Firestone. And that led me uh, to uh, be uh, the broker for a building in Memphis, 1.6 million square feet, which I sold to Mort Skolnick from Chicago. Right, and which became a great relationship. Great relationship. You over the years with Mort. Correct, right. Now, Mort and I bought the Verner's Ginger Ale building in um, Detroit. Woodward Avenue in Wood. And, right, Woodward Avenue in, in uh, Detroit. And then we bought um, uh, the Meisterbrow Brewery in Chicago. Um, and then we developed that to a shopping center. And we also bought the, the Goodyear Tire Distribution Facility of a million square feet in North Chicago, which we eventually sold uh, to uh, Centerpoint a couple and, of years ago. And then later on, the big property, the big Firestone property. Right. So in 2003, uh, Mort and I bought the, the, the Cater, Illinois Firestone property, which was 2,197 feet on 156 acres in 2003. And what did you do with it? Well, I, I was struggled. I struggled for a while. I um, used the money that I got to pay the taxes to operate the building. And then uh, with Mort, uh, his guidance, uh, he demolished the, the, uh, the powerhouse. We put in new utilities, um, um, ceiling units, heating units to replace the, the, uh, the low pressure steam we had in the building. And uh, now we had a 488,000 square foot building ready to lease and nobody to occupy it. Right, is that when Caterpillar comes in? Well, before Caterpillar came in, I was running out of money, and another company called Keen Transportation approached me, and I sold them six acres for $360,000, which was a magnificent deal for me. It kept me alive for the next year, and then Caterpillar came to us, and they leased the building. Let's talk about Colonial Village in Edison. When did, and that you bought with Mandelbaum. I bought that with the David Mandelbaum from the proceeds that Stephen and I uh, uh, had from the sale of, of the building in Teaneck. Now, let me just go back a step. So we represent the United Methodist Publishing House, and uh, we get a contract, and, and the publishing house says, we can't close right away. We need a long-term contract. Uh, well, I got Steve uh, to put up a second mortgage, $40,000 from his condominium, in Fort Lee. We used that money as a down payment. And the phone rang. It was Garibaldi Real Estate from New Jersey. They said, we have a tenant for the building. And remember, we haven't closed yet. So we have a meeting with Garibaldi. And who's the tenant? It's Sony. So we signed a 10-year lease with Sony. And then uh, the phone rings. Uh, it's Earl Reese, who was uh, Steve Siegel's mentor. He has uh, a buyer with another broker uh, from Bankers Trust. So we sold the building uh, to the... Uh, these three Brazilian generals for three and a half million dollars, and we made a two and a half million dollar profit on the building. And that's how you bought some. And that's how I bought Colonial Village. Okay. Uh, with David. With, with like a minute and a half left, let's, I, I want to make sure we're going to talk about the family, but one other thing that you recently did a couple of years ago was the former Exxon station on Route 4, right? Right. Where you 
where you were able to be creative enough that you brought in Starbucks and the and Bank, Bank of, of America. Right. Okay, and that's you were honored by the Fort Lee Chamber of Commerce a couple of years ago. As man of the year. Right, and also NAOP. Right. A number of years ago. Let's talk about the, the boys and your, your daughters. Sure. Daughter. Tell me about your sons. So Matthew is 36. He uh, works with me at the Weiss Realty in New Jersey, and we have a great partnership. And Jordan, uh, who's 33, he works for Seville, which was formerly Studley, um, and he is a leasing broker in the city of New York, and they, do, they both do very well. And then you have a... Uh, I have a stepdaughter, Haley. What does she do? She is an executive with Allianz, uh, pharmaceutical in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and she's doing very well uh, at public relations for, the, for them. And you're married to Susan. We have plenty of pictures of Susan. Right, and terrific gal, and she's the reason why I'm here, because she's the motivating factor behind me. And so, you know, it's interesting that fortunately, you, you know, you changed from Bowling Green to City College, and you're doing a good job in helping City College and you've been a wonderful guy, and it's nice to tell the story of Jamie. And thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.